So Adam Davis is our next speaker. Uh, he's a scientific support coordinator working with NOAA's emergency response division scientific support team for District 8. And so you heard from Mike Sam about that massive area of District 8. Um, so he's a scientific support coordinator for that whole plan. One of them. One of them. Well, uh, thanks for having me. Thanks, Missy. Thanks, C. Grant. And um, thanks to all of you for coming. I see some familiar faces out there. That's always good. And I see some unfamiliar ones out there. And that's better for me because, you know, part of our job really is just about getting the message out, helping people understand the science, helping people understand the roles so that when, God forbid, we have a really bad spill, we're not starting from scratch uh, with everyone. So if you would just humor me a little bit this morning, I'm going to do a little social experiment. So what I'd like you to do is if everybody would please stand up. You're probably relieved to be able to stand up after that delicious breakfast this morning. So think in your head of a number between one and three. Okay? So if you're number one, I want you to put your hands like that. Okay? If you're number two, I want you to put your hands like this. And if you're number three, I want you to put your hands like that. Okay, hang on just one second. So I told my boss I would get a standing ovation. <laughs> 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 I stole that trick from somebody recently. So feel free to steal it. It's a good one. So uh, again, I work for NOAA. <laughs> How many folks out there have worked with NOAA before? Okay, great. So, you know, NOAA is this, you know, gigantic science agency. It's the largest federal uh, science agency in the United States, okay? And we do all kinds of science. And I'm not going to talk about all that today. I'm going to talk about a little small group within NOAA that I work for that's dedicated to just build science and build science, excuse me, science support to spills. Okay. So I work for the emergency response division, and that's when the, that's within the Office of Response and Restoration. Okay. And I'll talk to you a little bit about what those other groups within the Office of Response and Restoration do, mostly just ERD. And I'm going to start with kind of a little bit of history because we've been around for a while. <laughs> and I think perspective is, is, in my experience, is one of the things that's kind of lacking uh, with regards to uh, people's understanding of oil spill science and people's understanding of oil spill response. I didn't all start with deep water, okay? So, um, sorry, that one got clipped off a little bit, but it says ERD early history, astronauts and oil spill cowboys. So what the heck do astronauts and cowboys have to do with spill response? Well, it started with a gentleman named John Robinson, and he was an engineer for NASA back in the early days of the Apollo mission, which was the mission to send the man to the moon, right? And John <coughs> worked for NASA as a flight engineer. And for those of you who are not familiar with NASA, the way that NASA works on those missions is everybody works for the flight engineer, right? The team is assembled, they have a great plan, there's lots of training that goes into it, but when they implement the mission, right, something always goes wrong, okay? And what they do is they have a dedicated team there assembled with roles assigned, specialties, knowledge, information, experience, so that they can solve those problems, okay? Well, <clears throat> John left NASA in the early 70s and came over to this new science agency called NOAA. And he kind of took that philosophy with him. And what he did was, he was kind of a, a brilliant guy. He saw in the early 70s how all of this oil spill exploration was taking place in Alaska. Right, it's the big boom of the time. Okay, and he thought, "Wow, we don't really understand much about oil spills, so maybe we ought to have a dedicated team that's available to provide some science." And in order to do so, well, we better start learning about it. Okay, and <clears throat> he really thought, you know, here's this pristine environment in Alaska; it would be really horrible if there was a really bad spill. And he knew it was going to come sooner or later. 
So he worked really hard to start refining the team that was able to do that. And he got a group of scientists together. <clears throat> and again, nobody was really doing this science at the time, uh, you know, throughout the world. This was just a very small group of people. And then about two years after that, after he assembled this initial team, there was a spill down in Chile. Okay, several million uh, gallons went into a remote area, okay, and there was very little response to it. So John and his team, the old school cowboys thing comes from the fact that whenever there was a big spill anywhere in the world, they would jump on a plane and they would go down there and they would stay. And this spill, <clears throat> they did very little to clean it up, okay? So we had an opportunity to study what happens when you don't clean up an oil spill over a long period of time. And I'm sure you can kind of all come to the conclusion that probably not very good. But <clears throat> what we really understood was how does wet oil weather over time? What are long term consequences of not doing cleanup? Uh, we learned a lot about oil uh, behavior, and oil transport, all of those kinds of things. So if you're ever interested in your oil spill history, look up this spill. It's, a, it's an interesting one. And then about four years later in 1976, <coughs> excuse me, there was another really large spill off of Nantucket. Does everybody know where Nantucket is? Okay, does everybody know where the senators and the congressmen and all those folks of Washington like to go in the summertime with their families, right? So it's a very high profile spill and a large one as well. And what happened with this was this was the first really large national spill where there was really intense political pressure and there were lots of folks who sort of came to the table in terms of ideas about what to do. Okay, especially science, right? There's lots of science up there. Woods holes up there, right? There's lots of oceanographers up there. So John and his team had already kind of been assembled. They had a couple spills under the belt. They learned some some good things, and John still had this idea in his head about the you know the flight engineer, the NASA concept. So he went to the Coast Guard and he said, "Listen." How about instead of you having to hear from all of these different types of people, we'll take this science coordination role from you, okay? Or we'll do it for you, rather, okay? And we'll be that sort of arbiter of the science. We'll coordinate it. So they tried it, worked pretty well, it was pretty successful, okay? Coast Guard liked it. And uh, a little bit of time goes on, and they formalized the team in 1976. And there's a great book out there that was written by one of the original, uh, he was a contractor that supported the team by the name of Miles Hayes, it's called Black Ties. And it talks about uh, all this early experience. But essentially, this group was composed of marine biologists, okay, so they understood the biology, you know, what are the effects of spills, they started to understand the chemistry, right? Oil is very complex chemical groups, so thousands of chemicals, right? You gotta have some chemists. And they had some oceanographers as well that were really talking about those transport mechanisms and those big ocean systems and how that relates to oil spills. So then in 78, there was another big spill in, <clears throat> in France, the Amico Cadiz. And in 79, a little bit closer to home, which a lot of people don't know about, in the Gulf of Mexico, this was the first oil spill, uh, excuse me, the first well blowout in the Gulf of Mexico that released hundreds of millions of gallons of oil in the Gulf of Mexico. That was a very shallow water blowout down there at the Bay of Campeche. And we learned a lot from that spill. It's kind of funny, a lot of the techniques that they tried to contain that spill early on the same techniques that we later use during deep water. So forward on to about 10 years later in 1989, and certainly these weren't the only spills that we worked on in the interim, but these were the really the game changers for us. These really large spills, we always learned something really new from, okay? And about these, <coughs> to credit John, 
for his uh, forethought to get this team together, he knew sooner or later we're going to have a bad spill in Alaska. We are. And he was right, right? Covered thousands of miles of shoreline, very remote area, very challenging to respond to. So we learned a lot about having to deal with a very large spill over a large geographic area. Okay. And what we really, the big takeaway from this one is sometimes um, cleanup techniques can be too heavy handed. Okay. Your cleanup can be more damaging in terms of the actions that you take than the oil itself. Okay. So there's a fine balance that you have to take. Okay. And we learned a lot about that. This high pressure, hot water. Uh, clean that they're doing here. Basically, you're killing all the biota, right? You're cooking them. They like to just put them all on a stove, okay? Well, they don't recover. And so, you know, one of the misconceptions a lot of times is we clean up every little bit of oil, but we don't. And there's reasons for that. And the reasons are because we don't want to have, we don't want to do what we say is more harm than good, okay? You'll have to keep me on it one time here. Uh, so in 2010, a new paradigm, of course, you know, this was another one. Science from all corners of the globe, literally, on this one. You know, the science teams, they stood up <coughs> just for individual issues like dispersion, right? Like burning, things of that nature. We're teams of, you know, 20, 30, 100 people, okay? And this took place over, you know, eight months of the spill. But then it followed on from the spill. And you can see the Degonry group is still continuing to this day. Okay? We're still learning lessons from deep water. And the, the really big kind of takeaways for me from deep water is all about these political influence and the conspiracy stuff that came out of it, which I thought was really negative. I worked deep water, not for Noah at the time. <coughs> and, you know, yeah, it was a horrible spill, but I can tell you there were a lot of very dedicated people that worked that spill tirelessly, you know, 17, 20 hours a day for months at a time. And it wasn't that we didn't have a good plan and we didn't execute, right? It's just sometimes it's bigger than you can really respond. That's just, you know, the honest truth. But one of the things that, that happened was this, and I think Mike alluded to it a little bit earlier, was this public misperception that, well, why is BP, why is the person who is responsible for spilling oil also cleaning up the oil? And that kind of led to this, you know, we're, we live in this environment now where people are um, quick to jump to conclusions that there's something afoot, right? Well, I can assure you there was nothing afoot there, okay? And that the science that BP contributed and the technical resources they contributed from my experience for top notch. Okay. Nobody was trying to hide anything from anybody. But you have a system where you have to release information that you know to be true. And sometimes, in the absence of saying something, people come and jump to conclusions. Okay. <clears throat> so that's one thing I think we could do better in the future. And the other part is that when spills get really big, Political influences tend to dominate and not the science. And that, to my, to my, from my perspective as a scientist, is a bad outcome. Okay? So we should really try and avoid that. So, what do we do in response now? Well, we say we bring science to the decision maker. Okay? Who? Uh, well, I'm not going to ask who. I would just tell you, I wasn't one that said no to let it full school science. I mean, oil spill response early on, right? We don't lead the response, right? The federal on scene coordinator leads the response. What we do is we bring science to those decision makers so that they can make the decision, okay? And that involves oil chemistry, what we call resources at risk analysis. We want to know what harm is going to be done. There's specific, <coughs> excuse me, specific techniques for shoreline assessment. We've learned a lot for 40 years of cleanup about what works and what doesn't work. Okay. Um, NOAA also acts as the Department of Commerce trustee representative. Okay, that means that the Marine Mammals, uh, National Marine Fisheries Service, um, endangered species that are uh, marine uh, species, 
uh, fish, all of those are in the trust of the United States. Somebody has to speak for that resource. So NOAA does that. Um, and we also get involved a lot in consultation. Um, this is a requirement. <clears throat> you know, it's really easier for a private entity to respond to a spill than it would be for the federal government because we have to play by a lot more rules, follow a lot more paperwork than they do. But one of the things that we have to always ensure is that we're in compliance with all federal regulation, okay? That's Endangered Species Act and other things. If you want to see what it is, what kind of scientific support exactly we provide, you can go to response.restoration at noaa.gov and you look up this FOSC's guide. And that's what we provide to them. My clicker's not working. There we go. Uh, sorry, I was too generous in my scaling of my slide here. So essentially that says that the ERD is composed of the field team, which is folks like me, the coordinators, the 13 of us across the country who work in Coast Guard districts. Okay, and, the, and what we refer to as the home team. And these are these specialists, right? It's still that same model that John started. Chemists, biologists, oceanographers, data management folks. Now with the age of computers, we have programmers, right? IT specialists, all of that. And then we have this extended family of contractors, excuse me, that support us as well. And that includes RPI and LSU. So here's how we're kind of <coughs> situated. Like I said, there's 13 of us spread around the country. In Coast Guard District 8, there are three of us. I have sort of the heartland, and then I have a counterpart in New Orleans, and then one in Texas. And every time I show people this map, they're like, wow, why do you have such a big area? Well, for about 40% of our spills occur in Louisiana that we support, okay? And why is that? Well, it's because of oil infrastructure, right? Spills occur where the production is highest, okay? And that's why there's multiple ones in Coast Guard District 8. So um, real quick, oh, we've got about five more minutes, three minutes, thank you. Um, when we look at oil spill response, this was, John and his group, um, Gary Dalton and others, framework that they came up with early on. And they said, look, if you have any question during a spill, it kind of falls within one of these five categories, right? This is how we bring good science to response. It's if we can have and find good answers to all of these questions as we go around, then we can affect a good response. And so subsequently, we specifically tailored uh, our tools, our products, our services, uh, our software that we provide, uh, our guidelines, all of those kinds of things in these broad categories, okay? And that's the kind of uh, construct that we use for all spill response, small and medium. And this is just sort of a timeline that we have. <clears throat> We're 24-7 response if the phone rings in the middle of the night. You know, within a short period of time, we need to be able to start turning around products to support that response. Okay? So when I talk about science, I'm really specifically talking about response science. It's not academic science, let's go study it for two years. Okay, that's other people do that. And we take and learn from those lessons. But the science that we focus on is the immediate science that needs to be told. Okay, where's the oil going to go in an hour, in two hours, tomorrow? Okay, what are we going to do to clean it up today? Those kinds of things. Um, I always say, you know, I'm always standing next to the best looking Coast Guard person out there. So no, but we're in the field, we're working directly with those folks. We're on the command staff, the SSC is working directly in support of that federal on scene coordinator. Okay, to give them good support for the decisions that they make. But we also have teams that are spread out throughout the response, depending on the scale and the needs of the incident. Some of the products that we provide, <clears throat> you know, if we're doing a trajectory, where's the oil going to go? Well, we also want to be the people on the helicopter that's going out and calibrate. Where is the oil today? Okay. We want to <clears throat> have informed science. We want to be making good observations in the field, and that will either be with us, or with our contractors or our partners. Um, and this is kind of going into detail about SCAT, which is our shoreline classment, excuse me, shoreline cleanup assessment technique teams. 
Okay, and this is all about going out and determining where the oil is, which cleanup techniques are appropriate, and a systematic way of doing that. And we'll get into cleanup recommendations. Everything is going to computers now, and what we will we'll want real time information of where are things in the response, where is cleanup taking place, where is the oil. Uh, we do a lot of that. We have this Irma system, which is operational, it's designed to ingest all of the data from the incident so that we have a display of that information. Those are just some trajectory maps. These are our weathering tools so we can determine how oil is changing over time. And then just some more tools associated with chemical, excuse me, chemical spills, because we don't just do oil. And those are those, I won't get into that. More tools, more products. This is with regards to resources at risk. So when we're not doing response, and I know I'm over time, so I'm gonna wrap it up. When we're not doing response, what we're doing is we're preparing for response. And that's training, that's planning, okay? That planning effort that Mike talked about, we're very inter intricately involved in. Um, we're mapping where those biological resources are, okay? Um, so that we have an understanding of, you know, what's gonna get hurt during an oil spill, we can <clears throat> take action early on to protect more sensitive environments, things of that nature. All of these can be accessed through our digital systems. And then, you know, that's just what I just said. We're also, we do a little bit of research. Uh, we're doing a lot more research now that there's more money out there. So the chief scientist for OR&R is involved in, you know, science. Uh, a lot of it's being funded by Bessie these days. And then we do a lot of training. We train about 1,000 to 2,000 folks a year. All of the information that we synthesize over the years, we try to condense and put in usable forms. That will be job aids, manuals, whether it's specific to oil spills and marshes, oil spills and sea turtles, uh, how we do our oil observations from helicopters, um, SCAT, all of that kind of stuff. And those can be found on our website. I mentioned the training. <clears throat> Those are just some new products that we've put out recently. Aloha, Gnome is our trajectory model. And all of this information can be obtained from our website, which is, if you just Google response restoration NOAA, it'll get you there. It's all there. So those are the web resources. Uh, we think it's a good website. There's also a blog that we put out. We encourage people to get on that and understand what it is that we do. How we support you during the show. With that, I think.